Hey buds, welcome to another episode of Keeping Carlson Short Shift, your twice-weekly or tweakly fantasy hockey podcast hosted by two fellas who are huge champs. I am your host, Ben Burnett. Joining me, as always, my co-host, Louis Ezekiel. Louis, how are you doing tonight? I am uh, battling off the tryptophan here, but I am psyched and ready to podcast. It's been a really interesting week with the schedule the way it's been. Not a whole lot going on tonight, but plenty of goal scoring, so that at least has been interesting. Yeah, Lewis, I'm in Canada, so I didn't even think to start off the show by wishing you a happy Thanksgiving. But of course, happy Thanksgiving to you, my South of the Border podcast partner. Oh, much appreciated. Uh, very, lots to be thankful for this time of year. We had a great time uh, getting together with family and friends. I went all out. I did the two-day turkey brine, and then I did uh, injection marinade and rub, and then deep fried. It was outstanding. And meanwhile, I was in Canada eating soup with some bread. So uh, <laughs> we had kind of opposite evenings, I think. I'm uh, I'm definitely not off the trip to Finn myself right now. Lewis, before we get into tonight's show, of course, we are brought to you by Keeping Carlson. You can become a patron of Keeping Carlson by heading to keepingcarlson.com slash patron. You can follow Lewis and I on our Twitter account at twitter.com slash AVG time on ice. Lewis, you wanted to tell a little anecdote before we got going and I would love to hear it. So just sort of thinking about the Facebook group as being such a super useful resource. Wednesday night, we had three goalie changes at the last minute with Howard, Demko, and Kemper all starting when it seemed that their counterparts would be starting for the evening. And by the time I even got to the Facebook site, there were already people who were posting about each of these. Uh, So we had a nice thread going of all the last second changes. So really useful resource, obviously. Lots of people very tuned in. If you are not someone who is actively glued to Twitter at all time, uh, you have a number of people who are that way posting in the group at all times just trying to help each other out and give you uh, the starts that you need to be successful. Now, uh, obviously those Howard and Demko starts did not go the way that their owners would have hoped, um, but at least you would have known what was going on. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully that's not the starts you resorted to. And instead, you didn't use an ad. You had a third goalie who was sitting on the bench waiting to get used. So yeah, hopefully, um, hopefully you were on top of those sudden changes in starters. I know for me, I ended up putting in Kemper. And he had an okay start, but in our format, he got outscored by Dave Riddich, who I bumped to the bench. Hopefully that one doesn't come back to uh, to hurt me too badly. Lewis, we're going to get into tonight's show. I wanted to ask you first about a player who I know you have in the cupful to keeping Carlson Ultimate Patron Fantasy League. David Pasternak, after a hat trick against the Habs on Tuesday night, is now on pace for 75 goals on the season. How high do we think Pasta can fly? Uh, well, for starters, I was also starting Carey Price in that game, so my joy was somewhat muted by his negative eight cuckupful points. But I have generally been extremely thankful to have David Pasternak on my roster. So this is an interesting question. I dove into his numbers here a little bit, just kind of looking for some things out of the ordinary. So his 5-on-5 five five individual shooting percentage is at 16.6, which is the highest of his career, but it's not too far out of line what he's been able to do in the past, and it's definitely not kind of your Oshie-esque overachievement. Uh, his IBP at 5v5 is also pretty high at 84%. It's a few percent higher than his best and 10% higher last year. It's really on the power play where he is putting up some unsustainable numbers that are helping him to be so successful this year. He's shooting nearly 43% on the power play. Obviously not sustainable. His individual expected goals on the power play for the season is under four, and he has 12 power play goals right now. So regression seems inevitable, but even still, you know, if you would look at him maybe as a sell high, who could you sell high for? I think you got to enjoy the ride with Pasternak unless you can land McDavid. So say he regresses down to just four shots a game from 4.34, and his shooting in all situations goes from 23% to a more reasonable 15%, that would still be good for 35 more goals this season for a total of 58. Pretty good. I could see him getting 60 even if he regresses. Yeah, the thing about the power play, like we've seen people shoot at 40% for a season. We saw... For example, Braden Point do that last year. It's not something I would bet on. I don't think that he'll hit 40 over the course of a full season. 
40 percent that is on the power play and i mean right now he's on pace for i think he's on pace for like 40 power play goals this season so i definitely don't think that that's going to sustain but i do think that we could see a 25 percent or 30 percent power play shooting percentage from david poster not not rest of season but over the course of 82 games here just after such a incredibly hot start uh, moving forward, Lewis, we want to talk about some outcheries. Specifically, we've had a return by my hero, Mika Zibanejad, finally back uh, to center the top line in New York. He is surrounded by Chris Kreider and Pavel Buchnevich at 5-on-5, uh, five five, and then they have Panarin, Philly Heat, and Ryan Strom as the second line. Those are the two scoring lines right now in New York. If you have a player who's not on that top six, then he is probably not going to get a ton of run or offensive opportunity. And that top power play is Mika, Panarin, Kreider, Strom, and Fox. Anyone we're buying or dropping uh, on the Rangers based on this news, Lewis? So we talked a little bit about uh, some of the Rangers players last week, uh, especially Fox and D'Angelo. I'm not ready to drop D'Angelo yet, as I said last time, uh, just because he's not on that top power play. It's been pretty fluid, but he's one to keep an eye on. It certainly looks like Heedle is in a great spot there with Panarin and Strom. He might be someone that I would think about slipping in, um, although he's not getting that power play time. I do think that those two are some really capable line mates for him that he hasn't had the chance to play with so much so far this season. And then uh, this obviously is not great for Capocacco. He probably shouldn't have been held in one-year leagues even before he got knocked back down to the bottom six, but make sh- I think uh, you know unless you're in a keeper league, it's probably time to say sayonara to Capocacco. I was definitely into Capo in the short term when he was getting some top six and top power play deployment in the twilight of Zabanajad's injury disappearance. But at this point, yeah, he's he's a clear stream out in one year leagues. Uh, tough hold in shallower keeper leagues as well. Like I, I'm in a keep eight and if he finishes with like 45, 50 points, I'm, I'm not really sure that he's a must keep for most of the teams in the league. So yeah, definitely this might be a moment where you stream him out. If I'm in a one-year league, I'm keeping my eye on him. I'm going to keep him on my watch list just because I think that this is an opportunity for him in the long-term sense to really figure out his game. I think that we're going to have some stretches of the season where Capocacco is putting up really decent numbers. I just don't think we're going to see it over a full Obviously, we didn't see it for the first 20 or so games, and hopefully we can see it for most of the next 60. I just don't expect it to be for the entire time. Uh, One more outchery to get to tonight. Miko Rantanen will finally be back on the ice this weekend. He's not expected to play Friday, but he will rejoin the Avalanche for the second part of their back-to-back with Chicago on Saturday. And just in time for his return, although very unfortunate for the Avalanche in general, Andre Burakovsky was hurt in Wednesday's game, and it looks like Rantanen took Burra's spot on the top line opposite Mack and Donskoy, meaning we will see Eunice maintain some short-term value while Landeskog remains out. Are there any other important rises or falls in value as a result of the Rantanen and Burakovsky news that you can think of, Lewis? So I think this one has a little bit less of a ripple effect than we saw for the Rangers. Uh, I definitely thought about Donskoy when you originally wrote the question, and I agree. I think he's uh, still going to maintain a nice spot and hold on to him until we see how things shake out once Landis God gets back. Other than that, though, I think the players most benefiting from Rantanen's return are people like Grubauer or the top power play. Uh, who are going to get their second most offensive gifted player back to help drive play, deliver goals, keep the puck in the offensive zone. You know, the the Avalanche are better with Miko Rantanen on the ice, and so it's going to benefit the people who play with him most frequently and obviously their goalie playing behind him. Absolutely. I own Grubauer in my keeper league, and I was devastated when uh, he started to struggle a little bit lately. Hopefully the return of Rantanen is not long followed by the return of Gabriel Landeskog as well, and we can see this top unit of the Avalanche uh click entirely while they've been out though Nathan McKinnon has main has been pretty busy and we've seen some really incredible numbers from him Lewis there was a tweet you mentioned do we have that one handy in 13 games since Landis Cog and Rantanen have been injured McKinnon has scored nine goals 11 assists eight of them primary assists he has taken 78 shots on goal he has attempted 128 shots 
He's had 21 minutes and 35 seconds of time on ice per game, and the Avalanche are outscoring teams 22-13 to 13 with him on the ice. Uh, really eye-popping numbers. Uh, the 78 Ridiculous. shots on goal. I mean, just totally beyond what you would expect. It's, it's wild. So he's averaging six shots a game with his two best line mates out over the course of 13 games. That number is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, could we see Nathan McKinnon hit 400 shots this year? With his line mates returning, you hope that they can have a little bit more uh, improved distribution. But I, if anyone could do it, this is certainly is the guy. I spent all summer long in my keeper trying to... Uh, make an offer that could get McKinnon on my team and the owner was just not having it and clearly he was correct because this guy is willing his team to victory without you know two-thirds of the rest of the top line it's it's really impressive like heart trophy type stuff yeah absolutely if he uh it would not be a shock to see him get it this year except for the fact that both McDavid and Dreisaitl are going supernova. Perhaps they eat into each other's cases enough that McKinnon can slide in there as the third player. A few more headlines that we'll get into before we get into the second segment in our episode. We've seen a hand injury that's going to sideline Ryan Nugent Hopkins throughout the weekend. Uh, A personal family matter, a sickness in the family has caused both Devin Dubnik and Marc-Andre Fleury to miss some time, though we do expect Fleury to be back. It is unclear what the timeline is on that. And uh, with Anthony Mantha out, we've seen Robbie Fabry go top line in Detroit, while Philip Zadina has taken that spot on the top power play in Detroit. Lewis, any sort of thoughts on the players we've mentioned here as we quickly uh, run through these headlines? I mean, I think it's a great uh, opportunity for Fabry. It would be a stronger position if it wasn't Mantha who was injured, who has by far been the most productive part of that top line. Uh, I think that also kind of hurts Zadina's case. Uh, for being on the top power play with Mantha out is just that, you know, it's a power play that is missing its most powerful weapon. So I think it's great for Fabry if you've been holding on to him. This is an improved opportunity for him. He might be worth a stream in playing on that top line. I'm not nearly ready to take the plunge on Zadina. Zadina is improving in the AHL. He's up to .68 points per game this year after posting .59 points per game last year. It's still not the type of production I think that Red Wings fans, myself included, were hoping to see from him. You know, maybe there's a reason that he was, you know, dropped down into their lap. So I've dampened my short-term enthusiasm on him considerably. I do think after a couple years of of getting it together, he's going to be in good shape. Uh, And, you know, at least he might be in a position where his... ELC runs out and he's not going to cost the Red Wings an arm and a leg uh, before he really gets going. But we'll see. We'll see what what we have with Zadina. Uh, I'm not thinking that he's going to be especially useful in one year leagues. I will say on the topic of the Red Wings, uh, I wrote a column on Dylan Larkin last weekend saying that I really expect him to get going again. This news, the Mantha injury, definitely doesn't make me excited about that possibility. Mantha seemed to be the only one who was really firing on all cylinders in Detroit to this point. So I'm my hope is that Larkin kind of takes the team on his back a la Nathan McKinnon and shows that he can do something similar without his extremely productive line mate so far this season. I'm not 100% hopeful, but... That's where we're at with Detroit. We kind of just have to hope that they can get things together because the early returns without Anthony Mantha have not been very promising. No, that was a really hideous match against the Toronto Maple Leafs the other night, making Chief Keefe look really good over there behind the bench in Toronto when you just get to beat up on the uh, punchless Red Wings. Yes, I saw also today a tweet that had the points percentages of all the teams by the end of uh, the end of Thanksgiving, and your Detroit Red Wings were, I believe, 15th out of 16 teams in the East. So not the best sign for you know you'd, you'd like to see them beat up on an actually good team, but you'll take the six nothing wins when they fall to you. All right, Lewis, let's get into our final segment tonight. Typically on our Thursday show, we do our hashtag patron five segment where the patrons of Keeping Carlson vote in the five players that they find the most interesting that week. And we go a little bit deep on them this week. We thought, you know, it's Thanksgiving. There's not too many games this week. We thought we'd we'd juice it up a little bit. We'd have a little fun with it. So instead, we've decided to make our all Thanksgiving list 
of fantasy hockey lines that we are most thankful for. Both Lewis and I have created one forward line, one defensive pair, and one goalie. Our starting lineups for Thanksgiving, if you will, of players that we are thankful to have drafted. Lewis, I'm going to defer to you. Why don't you tell me your your scoring line, your your offensive starters for your all Thanksgiving team? So what I'll do is we'll go through position. We'll give their average draft position on Yahoo and their current rank according to Kakupful scoring, the Keeping Carlson Ultimate Patron League. Uh, so at left wing, I have Jonathan Huberdeau. Average drafted position at 65 and currently the 20th ranked player. I have at center Jack Eichel, drafted on average at 31 and currently ranked number 9 overall. And at right wing, David Perron, average draft position 170, currently the 47th ranked player. Uh, really enjoying having him. And I'll, I'll take it back uh, talking a little bit about each of these guys. So Perron is on pace for 75 points. This would be by far the best total of his 13-year NHL career. He's just meshing really well with Ryan O'Reilly on the power play and at even strength. Uh, just someone that I picked up off a of free agency and have been rolling with ever since. He's been really outstanding for me. Eichel is a guy I have in every league that I'm playing in this season. Uh, He just dropped into the second or third round for most people, as evidenced by his 31 average draft position. Eichel is pacing for over 100 points and nearly 300 shots with four minutes of power play time on ice per night, including 12 points over the last seven games, which featured a four-goal night versus Ottawa on November 16th. Uh, Getting back to my left wing, Huberto is officially off Band-Aid Boy status after not missing a game for the last couple seasons, and he is loving life on the top line. He is on pace for 36 power play assists this season. I love it. Uh, Perron actually made it onto my honorable mentions list. I have to say he might be on my all-tilt list of players who I'm devastated I didn't get in time when he became hot. I just... I missed him in all my leagues, and I've been really upset about it. Uh, Jack Eichel, kind of, he's not on my list, but I do have him in a lot of places, and I think that just goes to show that he was a ton of value this offseason, but center position to me still, I'm just looking at those guys who were like grossly outperforming their ADP, and so that's what you're going to see out of the center on my all-thankful team. I'm going to start with my left wing. I picked Leon Dreisaitl, average draft position 19, Kakupful rank second. My center, as I mentioned, I went with a budget pick. Anze Kopitar, average draft position 155, Kakupful rank 26, such good value. And at right wing, Andrei Svechnikov, 129th average draft position, and he is ranked 16th in the Kakupful. Obviously, Dreisaitl on pace for 148 points. You just can't really beat that value no matter where you draft him. If you that's that's top three pick stuff. And if you got him outside of the first round, you are absolutely killing it. You are probably in the top half of your league. If not, as and if you aren't, it is because you blew the rest of your draft picks after Dreisaitl. Uh With Kopitar and Svechnikov, I actually mentioned them both as possible sell highs, and I'm not really disagreeing with what I thought at that time, especially with Kopitar, someone who I think is overperforming. But this isn't about, you know, who's sustainable, who's not. This is about who I'm thankful for so far. So I got to give shouts out to Anjay for his performance to this season point per game with probably the worst supporting cast in the league. And then finally, Andre Svechnikov rounding out my top line, all thankful unit, just turning into the young superstar. We all hoped he could be looking like he's good for 80 plus. You know, I, I mentioned him as a possible sell high. If you could get a rant in like a 95 point guy. And I don't disagree with that now, but I, it would be pretty tough to let go of him considering how much value you got and how good you must be feeling about getting that value. I'm going to go ahead and say it. He might be the next bangers god, like OV tier guy. I don't see him scoring 50 goals a year for 10 years, but I think he might be that player who's, you know, so valuable in a multi-cat league that he, that he, uh, that he, you can, that you consider drafting him over the pure points player, like Ovechkin versus McDavid type debate that we have right now. 
Absolutely. And it's just really exciting to see Sveshnikov round into form so early. I think we've been really hungry for some of these second and third year players that we've been waiting on a little bit to, to kind of turn out and to see Sveshnikov seize his opportunity has been really awesome this season. Yeah, and I mean, having the deployment just continually improve, having him get stapled next to Sebastian Ajo, I, I really do think the sky is the limit. And yeah, 80, 85 points definitely seems sustainable to me at this point. If you can sell him for 95 or more, that's where I'd be looking. But uh, honestly, this isn't meant to be another sell high opportunity. This is meant to be shouts out Andre Svechnikov for all you're doing in my multi-cat leagues. You are the man. Let's move on to the defensive unit. Lewis, why don't you tell me who you had on your all-thankful defensive top pair? All right, so uh, one of the ones that I have on one of my teams I'm going to let you cover, uh, just, you know, our most outstanding defenseman of the season so far. I'm going to go a little deeper with a couple of my picks. Uh, not so deep is Shea Weber, whose average draft position was 95 and who is the 28th ranked player in Kakupful right now. He is on pace for 65 points and taking nearly three shots and getting two hits and blocks per game, doing most of his damage at even strength, so not even buoyed by a really hot uh, power play. So really enjoying what I'm getting from Weber right now. And then Oscar Clefbaum, average draft position at 164, currently the 32nd overall player. He is on pace for 30 power play assists and racking up two shots and three blocks each game, so giving you lots of peripheral value to go along with feeding the puck to some of those dazzling oil superstars that we've been talking about. Yeah, Clefbaum was someone who I ended up with in a ton of drafts because you just can't pass on that power play one option, especially with how late he was falling. He was going after Darnell Nurse in a lot of drafts that I was in, and so far, so good. I mean, he definitely slowed up, slowed down after that super hot start, but he had a stretch of 11 games without a point, and since then, he's been pretty much back to where he started. Nine points in his last nine games, and I don't really see why he can't, you know, not be a point-per-game guy, but be a 60-point guy playing with the superstars that he gets to play on the top unit with every single night. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, just amazing value at his ADP for sure. I should also say I, I need to take a bit of a mea culpa on Weber, a player who I thought for all intents and purposes was maybe on the downswing of his career here this season, and he has been pretty much the same player he's always been. I am a little bit concerned about the Canadians not stacking a top unit right now. Maybe that's just a function of the Jonathan Drouin injury, but I'm hoping for Shea Weber's sake that they will get away from splitting those units just because I don't really think of Montreal as a team who's good enough to split up their two, their top units. Like They're going to struggle for elite offensive production, and I would like to see them put a number, a definitive number one out there and make that defenseman Shea Weber instead of giving that time to Jeffrey Petrie. Maybe we'll see that happen sooner rather than later if the Canadians insist on continuing to get blown out by marginal teams at best. So they may, if they're going to decide that they need to be in a track meet to survive, they may need to load up that top power play just to stay in games if they can't stop a puck. Hey now, they also lose to really good teams like the Bruins, so they're they're an equal opportunity game blower. Don't don't go, don't go denigrating them too much here. Uh, Lewis, I'll chat about my defenseman. I had my man Douglas H. Hamilton, and the H is for holy hell. He has been so good this year. ADP of 89. He is ranked 10th in the Cupful. And of course, John Carlson deserves some love. ADP 46. He's been defenseman, or he's been player number six so far, defenseman number one on the season. Dougie obviously finally getting that power play one time and showing he deserves it. He was a flag player for me because the, the floor was so high that he was val- he was validating his draft position that if he happened to get that top power play opportunity which you know they they were splitting those top units to start the year they had they had Gardner with Aho so i feel like they almost didn't it, this almost didn't even happen but Dougie was just so good to start the year that how could you continue to deny it and Hamilton owners have been greatly rewarded for taking the swing on Dougie, so I am loving every minute of that. And then with Carlson, of course, paced for 144 through the first 12 games. 
only 15 points through his last 14, so a bit of a slump for this uh, superstar. But how high can he go on the season? He only needs a 67-point pace rest of the season to hit 82. I think that's pretty much a lock at this point. So, yeah, I th- welcome to the point per game club, John Carlson. You earned it, bud. Yeah, I worked hard to acquire Carlson last year in my keeper. I got him at the deadline. Uh, really pleased with it and was able to keep him over into this year. Uh, as far as Hamilton goes, I'm just really pleased that in Rally he's found somewhere where he's got lots of space to run around. He can visit all the museums he wants without any judgment, and he's finally gotten that top power play position that he so richly deserves. Lewis, we're going to get into our goaltending, and of course, this is where we had our first bit of overlap. Why don't you tell folks who we both picked as our goaltender? I don't think there's anyone who deserves the spot more than Darcy Kemper. Average draft position of 137, currently the 53rd ranked player overall in Cup full scoring. You know, with goalies, I think because people feel the need to, to fill those slots, their ADP tends to be inflated. Um, but certainly that wasn't the case for Kemper. You know, a lot of people suspected that Ranta would be back and taking over that position after his long periods of injury last year. So Kemper's ability to seize that position and kind of be the 1A so far, uh, and obviously playing very well, has helped boost his score into uh, close to the top 50, where you're not going to find a ton of goaltenders. The one thing I'll say about Kemper and his 53 is, I think in a points league that you're going to have goaltenders get somewhat overvalued versus undervalued based on starts, and with Kemper, the one disappointment is that he's not getting the full starter's workload. Imagine how many points he would have if he was getting 55, 60, if he was on pace for 55 or 60 starts this year. So I actually, when I was making my determination for a goalie, I went into my categories league and and I looked at who was way outperforming their draft position. And Darcy Kemper stood tall among that group. I got him maybe as like the 25th or 26th goaltender off the board. Nobody was pegging him to be the, the de facto starter. And he has looked totally rejuvenated in the desert. I would love for him to be the clear number one rest of season, but at this point, I got nothing to complain about. He's been amazing, and I'm ecstatic to have him on some fantasy teams. Let's be thankful for Kemper's continued health and hope that you know, playing a 1A position helps him maintain it for us throughout the fantasy season. I'm with you there, Lewis. Let's get into our honorable mentions real quick, and then we'll get out of here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a couple centers who I thought were worth mentioning. Uh, William Carlson, average draft position 150, currently 33rd overall. Braden Shen, ADP at 85, currently the 40th ranked player. And then someone that we both mentioned, uh, probably our greatest center overperformer. I only didn't include him as my center because I dropped him uh, a little too early, but Jean-Gabriel Peugeot. Uh, undrafted ADP and currently ranked number 42 in the Cup fall. I had I had Peugeot as a center as well, and the other two players I wanted to mention were Ryan Getzlav and Brock Nelson, both of whom way outperforming what they were drafted to do, and I am pretty excited about the possibilities. Getzlaff a little bit like Anche Kopitar, a player who's carrying his team despite his advanced age and looking great doing it. On the left wing, I wanted to shout out Max Pacioretty, JT Miller, and of course, David Perron, who you mentioned. And on the right wing, Anthony Mantha, who I actually had as a tie with Svechnikov, but the injury uh, the injury led me to defer to Svech. Uh, Konechny and Tom Wilson just absolutely lighting it up despite their devalue draft position. Who did you have on the wings there, Lewis? All right, so for my left wing, I selected Gensel, Mantha, and Nikolai Ehlers, who is having himself quite a nice season relative to his ADP of 160. And then on the right wing, I had JT Miller, Toivo Teravainen, and James Neal, who we all think will be returning back to Earth, but can't argue with his production at this point in the season. Yeah, he has definitely slowed down, but if you drafted him and also sold high on him, then you must be pretty ecstatic with what you've gotten out of James Neal. I hope that you took the opportunity to trade him if you did have him on your roster. Moving into the back end, I wanted to shout out Shea Weber, who you mentioned, and Clefbaum, who you also mentioned. I didn't realize that we were going to have that much overlap, and then I was going to include... Alex Edler. And for goaltenders, shout out to Tomasz Grice, David Big Savid Riddick, and Miko Koskinen. 
All right, so for my defense, I had Yossi, Kale McCarr, uh, who significantly overperformed his draft position despite all the hype about him, and Zidane Chara, whose initial ranking was down in the 400s. Uh, a guy kind of like Weber, who a lot of people thought was pretty much over the hill, is putting together a nice season for himself. He's on a little scoring run right now. I might check him out, you know, if he waited this long into the show. Check out and see if he's available on your waiver wire still, because he's been putting together uh, some very nice point production to go along with his typical peripherals. And then finally, for my goalies, uh, I included Dave Riddick as well. And, you know, again, kind of tough to get those ADP versus actual production. But Jordan Bennington has outplayed his average draft position of 50 so far this season. So nice to see uh, him continuing his excellent production from last year that got him a Stanley Cup. Absolutely. And folks, we've mentioned it a few times on our Twitter account at AVG Time on Ice today, but we are just so thankful that you guys have taken the time to listen, to interact with us, to respond, to rate us on iTunes on the Keeping Carlson uh, podcast network. And so we just wanted to read a few of the responses that you guys had when we asked for your thankful picks. At SuperGuy46, Super Dave said D'Angelo and Adam Fox from Waivers. Absolutely, Super Dave. Same, same. Uh, Chris Pudsey says Dreisaitl mid-second round in a 10-team league. Placeholder Kevin says Malkin in round two, Line A in round three, Yossi in round four. That sounds pretty good. I have a couple of those guys in the cupful, and I'm loving it as well. Lewis, any other ones that you wanted to mention who have responded to us today? Sure. So Joel Harischuk, who is frequently commenting, uh, interacting with us on Twitter, also liked Andrei Sveshnikov and Dougie Hamilton. So a guy who's thankful list lined up with ours pretty nicely. Thorny, uh, our good pal, had McDavid fall to him at number four in his league. Got Barkov in round two and Marner in round three. Tyson Berry is picking it up for him too, so that's going really well for him. And then he took Shattenkirk over, over Sergachev at our advice, and that's been working out well. Yeah, a few of the people with Dougie Hamilton I saw. Dave, uh, whose last name I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, but Dave H. says, In the first year of a five-year keeper league, he managed to pick up Leon Dreisaitl in the fourth round. Outstanding. That is foolish. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, Jesse Martin has picked up Anders Nilsson and Corey Crawford lately, which has really been helping him in his victories in the goalie uh, categories. Anders Nilsson also deserving a shout out for being a real hockey is for everyone ambassador, uh, especially as hockey is kind of bracing itself, I think, for a bit of a reckoning uh, with regards to some of the issues that have been on the rise um, relating to Bill Peters and Mike Babcock. So I want to shout out Anders Nilsson for being a great ambassador for hockey is for everyone. Absolutely. Shouts out and Anders Nilsson and shouts out hockey is for everyone. I hope that the reckoning that we've seen continues in the sense that people can feel more safe and more welcome into this game that we all love. Lewis, we are out of time right now. For myself, Ben Burnett, I am signing off. Why don't you take us home and get us out of here? Thank you, everyone, for sticking around for our Thanksgiving episode. Lewis, it's all you, buddy. All right, so thank you to Fantrax, Yahoo, ESPN, Natural Stat Trick for helping us with our research. Thank you for all of you for tuning in before I head off into my tryptophan-induced coma. I just want to remind you to play smart and keep your shifts short.